Hello, I am Dan Marino in San Francisco. And I'm Nihal Alhadi in Toronto. Welcome to The Conversation Weekly. We're joined from Melbourne by our colleague Ben Clark, executive producer of another podcast here at The Conversation. Hi, Ben. Hi, both. It's great to be on the show. Howdy, Ben. It's great to have you with us. You recently launched Fear and Wonder, and we're about to hear the first episode. Can you tell us what the series is about? Yes, absolutely. So Fear and Wonder is a new climate podcast brought to you by The Conversation. It will take you inside the United Nations era-defining climate report via the hearts and minds of the scientists who wrote it. Now, that report is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's synthesis report. Uh, Your listeners may have heard of it before in the news recently um, as it was released on March 20th, and it provided a a pretty dire verdict on the state of the Earth's climate. It represents the work of hundreds of dedicated scientists whose tireless work is often little understood and rarely acknowledged. So we decided to explore their lives and their work in greater detail through this podcast series. These reports are so important. They are always making the news and capturing headlines. I love that you guys are taking us behind the scenes so we can actually get in the minds of these people. So how are we getting there? Who's taking us on this journey here, Ben? Yeah, so the show is hosted by Joelle Gurgis, who is a climate scientist and a lead author for the IPCC, and her friend Michael Green, who is an award-winning journalist, and it's executive produced by me. Um, Michael and Joelle speak to various climate scientists from around the globe, uh, asking how they know what they know about climate change and what it feels like to carry that knowledge and do their vital work at this crucial moment in Earth's history. So what are some of the topics and ideas you guys are digging into over the course of the show? Yeah, so the series covers a wide range of topics from the IPCC's synthesis report, uh, including how climate scientists know that the climate is changing by comparing uh, contemporary data to the historical record, uh, how we know the sea is rising in the present day thanks to advances in measurement technology, uh, how scientists build climate models and attribute extreme weather events to climate change, how climate change is impacting the water cycle and monsoon seasons, and, well, that's just the first few episodes, uh, and there's plenty more in the other episodes of the series too. That's an incredible amount of information to cover. Where are you starting? What's the first episode about? Yeah, so in this first episode, uh, we introduce the series and look at how scientists know the climate has changed. So Michael and Joelle speak to French scientist Valérie masson uh to explain what the IPCC is, uh, what its reports contain, and how they're put together. They then speak to Professor Ed Hawkins from the UK and Professor Kim Cobb, who is a US-based paleoclimatologist, who describes the coral reef that she has researched for her whole career and its destruction in a bleaching event in 2016. Her interview is very moving, uh, and it really drives home the emotional toll of witnessing environmental destruction firsthand. As somebody who's been covering or following environmental issues for about 20 years now, this is such an interesting and not often seen perspective on environmental challenges. Where can people listen to the series? Yeah, so you can listen on theconversation.com or wherever you get your podcasts. So um, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts, it'll be there. All right, let's jump in. This is Fear and Wonder, brought to you by The Conversation. In this series, we're taking you inside the UN's era-defining climate report by the hearts and minds of the scientists from all around the world who wrote it. All right, Joel, so these swishy sounds that we're listening to, that's Professor Kim Cobb from Brown University in the US. She's diving on a coral reef in Carissimus, which is an atoll in Kiribati, due south of Hawaii, almost right on the equator. Kim is a really well-known coral reef scientist who was also a lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and she was part of the volume that I was involved in. In the video that we're watching here, so she's in a wetsuit and flippers and her hair's waving in the current and there's like a trail of bubbles coming up from her mouthpiece. She's got this clipboard and some kind of underwater pen. She's making notes about the vast array of, of coral in front of her. And so this video that she sent me, it's, it's from July 2015. And by that point, she'd been researching on Christmas for nearly two decades. 
And when I spoke to her, she told me that she'd mapped out about 30 different dive sites there over the years. And so at each one of these, they're all special, just like my children. <laughs> so they're all quite different to looking to me, but it's fun because you can see over you know, a decade, corals growing larger, you notice when the reef has taken a bad hit from wave activity and a bad winter storm, let's say, and you see the reef recover after that. And so it's like watching a child grow in a way. I mean, it's really special to be that attached to a place over many decades and to come back to it and come back to it and come back to it. You can really see just the extraordinary nature of coral reef ecosystems. We have reef fish swimming over, really brightly coloured corals. There's even sharks swimming nearby. And so when you look down at most of our sites, you know, you're seeing near 100% coral cover and a large diversity of species that quickly by eye you can notice is different changes in colours and structures and heights. And the reefs themselves form different shapes. Some of them are like flat carpets and some of them are the classic tongue and groove structures where you get these steep walls of reef. So in that video, we're looking at a coral reef in the year 2015. It was right before we had a big El Nino event, which was one of the biggest events that we've actually seen on record. Yeah, it's coming. So, you know, before the El Nino event, these were some of the healthiest reefs in the world. The temperatures reached their peak in November 2015 during our expedition there, and they were over three degrees Celsius warmer than usual. And then we went back five months later, and I I knew that it was going to be bad, but I truly, nothing prepared me for what we saw in our first dives there. And so it it was a, a, a gut punch that it took me weeks, weeks and weeks to process, and in some ways, perhaps I'm still processing it. My career and my personal life really changed dramatically after that. You're listening to Fear and Wonder, brought to you by The Conversation. I'm Dr. Joelle Gerges, and I'm a climate scientist at the Australian National University. I'm also a lead author on the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I'm Michael Green. I'm a journalist, and I'm a friend of Joelle's. And in this podcast, we're going to explore the life of these hugely influential IPCC reports and the kind of thinking and feeling that goes into them. And so the the reason for this show is that I happened to visit Joelle on New Year's Day 2020, and it was right in the middle of Australia's black summer bushfires, and my in-law's house had actually burned down in the fires the day before, and it was kind of lucky that they both escaped with their lives. Yeah, that's right. I remember and you guys were really stressed out and we'd gone to the beach and we're trying to just have some kind of normal sort of summer experience. But we knew that there was just so much unrest out there and a catastrophe was unfolding, really. And you were in the middle of working on the IPCC report and it was clearly a very intense process. And I think seeing you at that extreme moment was a catalyst for me to realise that even though I've known you for 15 years, I don't actually ever talk to you about the nitty-gritty of of climate science. And more than that, even though I read articles about climate change, and in fact I've, I've written some articles about climate change, I actually don't know how we know what we know about global warming. And given what was going on at that moment, I wanted to find out. This IPCC assessment is particularly important because it's the critical decade when we really need to stabilise the Earth's climate. So the stakes couldn't be higher. And it took thousands of scientists years to to write and review and to review and there are literally millions of words in there and it's monumental. Right and so when these monumental reports finally came out I decided that I wanted to speak to you and to other scientists about the science behind them to find out what you do and how you do it and also what it's like to carry that knowledge. For me personally, it's both terrifying and fascinating to be doing this work at this particular moment in human history. And the science itself, so what we know and how we know it, is just so interesting. So in each episode, we're going to speak to leading climate researchers from all around the world to learn about the science and the people behind the headlines. Okay, so to get us started, what are the IPCC reports? Who contributes to them and when did they begin? In this episode we'll hear from three contributors from very different fields of climate research. And as we trace some of the beginnings of modern climate science, we'll find our way to the top of a wet and windy mountain in Scotland 
more than 100 years ago. And then back to that tropical atoll in the middle of the Pacific Ocean to find out what Kim saw on that dive that changed her life. A question that we're really asking today is how do we know that the climate has changed? And so the first person that we're going to hear from today is Valerie masson delmont So um, um, I'm, I'm a climate scientist. I work south of Paris in France. Uh, and so Valerie is a big wig in the IPCC, right? Yeah, it's about as big as it comes. So Valerie is actually one of the co-chairs of the Working Group 1, which deals with the physical science basis. So she really is a bit of a, a ringleader for our group and somebody that helps coordinate how the report gets collated and also communicated to, to governments around the world. My own background is in physics of fluids and my research has been dedicated to the study of past climate using climate modelling and records from natural archives, in particular ice cores and tree rings. Something Valerie told me was actually kind of the inspiration for the title of this show, Fear and Wonder. And it was when she was explaining those past climates she studied and comparing them with where we're at today. The level of CO2 in the atmosphere is now reaching a level that was previously encountered more than 2 million years ago. So that's the outcome of human activities. It's vertiginous to measure how fast we've been able to alter the atmospheric composition, acting as a geological force (laughs) on the composition of the atmosphere. And it's really amazing if you stop to think about it. If you shift your perspective from how we experience life on those timescales of hours and and days and months and, and years, but when we're talking about climate change, we're really thinking about these really long timescales that happen on tens of thousands of years. And if you stop to really consider that, it's actually quite profound. The level of warming today, it's clearly unprecedented in more than 2,000 years. We're getting out of the range of temperature variations of the current interglacial periods, the past 11,000 years. And to find a period warmer than that, we need to go before the last ice age, about 125,000 years ago when the orbit of the Earth around the Sun was different. And so we could also, in the next decades, depending on what we are going to do in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, get completely out of the range of the warmest intervals of the past million years as well. I want to clarify something important, and that's exactly what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is, because it's not necessarily clear to everyone what it is and how it works. So the IPCC is really made up of a group of scientists that about every seven years come together under the guidance of the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program. And we effectively do a massive stock take of the state of the global climate system. And so the first report came out in 1990 and it went through obviously a whole range of peer review and expert review and also government review. The um, IPCC has a specific role. Uh, We're not just preparing, um, I would say, uh, encyclopedia (laughs) or textbooks associated with climate science. Uh, We are working so that the climate knowledge, the state of knowledge, is provided in a transparent and rigorous way, but also in a way that is relevant to inform decision making. It's a hell of a job to take on. Can you remember how you felt at that, at that time? So I felt the burden, that's clear. I felt the burden especially because climate science is scrutinised by people who are extremely reluctant to uh, implement any change. You know, merchants of doubt. So that pressure, I've known it for years. And having the ways to do the assessments in the most robust, rigorous way was how I dealt with that. So what Valerie's talking about there, I think, really taps into a sense of responsibility that we all feel undertaking a report like this. It has to be flawless, right? As Valerie says, it's it's really scrutinised. And it's not just any report. This is the underpinning of the actual science that is informing why we need to stabilise the Earth's temperature. So We have to be really careful about the science and our representation of all the literature. So it is a vast undertaking. But all of us feel that, this this immense sense of responsibility because the stakes are so high. Uh, Nobody, in in fact, is paid by IPCC to do that work. It's really a volunteer basis. 
uh, with the understanding of our uh, research institutions. And uh, we had about a thousand applications or nominations. It goes through observing bodies or through national governments. And then we selected about 234 of them. It takes a lot of time to do it well, to find the right balance within teams. Uh, with a, a strong wish to have diverse teams to avoid, you know, biases that can exist within a small community. Valerie's talking about how she chose the authors for the part that you worked on, Joelle, but there are other parts, right? So can you explain how it's split up? So generally speaking, the IPCC is divided into three main working groups. So working group one deals with the physical science basis. So that is all the nuts and bolts of how the climate system is changing from the deepest ocean trenches to the highest mountain tops. Uh, working group two deals with impacts and vulnerability and climate change adaptation. So how we actually go about getting societies prepared for the changes that are underway, but also ecosystems and seeing which ecosystems are under threat. And working group three deals with mitigation. So how do, what do we actually do in terms of trying to reduce emissions, restore ecosystems and bring about the societal changes that we need to put the earth back on track to try and reduce emissions and to stabilise the earth's climate. And then there's a synthesis report as well, right? Yes. So after all of that, there is a synthesis report which really takes the highlights from all the different volumes and puts it together. And it also touches on special reports as well, which I didn't mention, but they are the supplementary reports that were conducted ahead of the main working groups. And for instance, there was one on the oceans and cryosphere, so the frozen parts of the earth. There was also one on the 1.5 degrees of warming target. And there was another one on land ecosystems as well. So the sixth assessment report is actually made up of several volumes. So it is vast, it is huge. The workload has been unprecedented compared to previous cycles. So I've reviewed more pages of text than ever in my life. <laughs> and it's so nice to work with these scientists. That, for me, that's the best. It's a constant deliberation with critical minds on board. And it's like building on collective intelligence so that we provide the best possible assessment of the state of knowledge in a very clear way. So, Joelle, when did you find out that you were going to be an IPCC author? It was in early 2018, and I remember receiving a very formal-looking letter with the UN logo, and it said that I was assigned to the group which was dealing with water cycle changes. And I remember it just sort of blew my mind because I've, I'd worked with people who had contributed to the IPCC. They were complete legends in the field and people I really looked up to and admired, and I, and I was just amazed that I had been selected. What were you working on back then? What was your research about? I'd recently released my first book, which was called Sunburnt Country, The History and Future of Climate Change in Australia. And effectively, it was the culmination of about a decade's worth of, of research. And we were looking at reconstructing Australia's past climate back a thousand years, season by season for parts of that. We had just been through the millennium drought. And it was really important to try and contextualise how unusual those extremes were in a longer term context. And that's where it becomes really helpful to look into the past. And I started looking at a range of different records, so things like tree rings, corals and ice cores. And then when we have handwritten records, so things like weather journals, old colonial reports and newspapers, we can try and reconstruct past weather conditions on that sort of daily timescale. And that area of science is known as historical climatology. Okay, so this is then, I think, the perfect way to introduce our next guest, because this is just the kind of work that Ed Hawkins does. Exactly. That's right. My name is Professor Ed Hawkins. I work for the National Centre for Atmospheric Science at the University of Reading here in the UK, and I study how the climate has changed over the last couple of hundred years and why uh, and how it might change in the future. When Ed started working on IPCC, one of the parts that he was working on was, was a new section that hadn't been in previous IPCC reports, and it was aiming to cover the history of climate science. The thermometer was invented 400 years ago or so, so people have been measuring temperature for a very long time, and many people wrote down their measurements and recorded them in a very detailed way, and so we have an awful lot of very old records of, of temperature and other aspects of the climate going back a couple of centuries or more. Back in the 1930s, people started to realise that something was probably going on. People started to say, oh, hang on a minute, you know, the temperature's rising in quite a few places around the world. And then in 1938 came the first 
full attempt at creating a global temperature time series. And that was made by an amateur meteorologist called Guy Callender, who lived in the UK. And he collected data from 140 weather stations around the world. And he saw that the planet had warmed up over the previous 50 years by about 0.3 degrees or so. And so that was very clear in his data that the, the climate had already warmed at that time. Ed co-wrote a paper about Calendar looking into what he actually did. It is really fascinating that there were scientists working on these early attempts to, to see whether the planet had warmed or not, and they were doing those calculations by hand. And he also went one step further in that he also collected the available observations there were of changes in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. You know, we knew roughly how much coal was being burnt and therefore how much carbon dioxide we were adding to the atmosphere at that time. And he compared that with, with the data that he, he could get hold of. And then he made a very simple sort of estimate of how much the temperature should have risen given the increase in carbon dioxide and explained around half of the observed temperature change that he had seen. And so he put this all together in one key scientific study in 1938 saying, yes, the temperature's warmed ar around the globe. Yes, carbon dioxide has increased because of our activities and that has caused a rise in global temperature. So we had everything in one place over 80 years ago. And that was a surprise to many of my colleagues, actually, that that was done back in 1938. I had several people saying, I didn't know about this paper. I didn't know about this person doing this all that time ago. And that's something I think is really important, actually, for the wider public and, and the scientists to understand is how long we've understood the very basics of the science. You know, it's based in, in fundamental 19th century physics, which we've gradually understood more and more of through time to get to the stage we are today when we can be absolutely certain that we're causing the changes that we're seeing. So basically, Ed's work is just following on from what Guy Callender was doing, which was really trying to provide these estimates of pre-industrial temperature variations uh, at a time where we weren't using computers. And so we're looking at these old uh, handwritten records that allow us to take our estimates of global warming further back in time. Although we have these very good records of global temperature stretching back to the 1850s, that may make us sometimes think, well, our job's done. We, we know the past. We know, know what's happened. And in one sense, that's true. We can be confident about the rise in global temperatures that we're seeing. But as the science moves on, we're realising we need to understand more details about what's going on locally, and particularly around extremes and the risks that we face now and in also in the future. So with this work, Ed's trying to understand past weather events so we have a better understanding of what kind of extremes we could face in the future. But that means we need more detailed observations from the past. And it turns out we do have many detailed observations of the past, but they're just locked away in various archives and libraries still stuck on the original paper records they were recorded on over 100 years ago. You know, there are probably more than a billion observations just in the UK that, that we know of and stored in various libraries and archives. And transforming that data into digital is, is just a huge, enormous, unimaginable task, actually. And so we have to pick and choose at the moment about which, which records we focus on, which are going to be most valuable for improving our understanding. Back in 2017, we discovered the records taken on the summit of Ben Nevis. Ben Nevis is the highest mountain uh, in the UK, 1,345 metres above sea level. It's the coldest, wettest place in a very cold, cold and wet country, many people would say. This song we're listening to is called Entries from the Lock, and it's from an album by Neil Scriven, where each track is inspired by a chapter of a book that was written in 1905 called 20 Years on Ben Nevis, being a brief account of the life, work and experiences of the observers at the highest meteorological station in the British Isles. That's so cool. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it turns out that between 1883 and 1904, three brave, slightly crazy meteorologists lived permanently at the summit of the mountain in a stone hut. And every single hour, one of them would step outside the hut and record the temperature and the rainfall and the wind strength, uh, as well as recording pressure and, and uh, other aspects of what was going on. Every single hour, day and night, throughout the year, winter and summer, living through some of the, you know, the wettest, coldest weather that the, the UK can throw at them. 
1885, February 21st, at 1600 hours, the notebook for the observations was torn in two by the wind and blown away. After 1700 hours, no temperature readings were taken as the lamps could not be kept alight, nor could observers stand against the gale. At 2200 hours, the glass in one of the tower windows was broken by a flying lump of ice. Hello, I'm Tim Flannery, Chief Counselor of the Climate Council. We're proud sponsors of the Fear and Wonder podcast. The Climate Council is Australia's own independent, evidence-based organisation on climate science, impacts and solutions. We need urgent action on climate now. But to make this happen, we need your ongoing support. Make a weekly or monthly commitment to combat the climate crisis with us. Sign up as a new member in April and you'll receive a copy of Joel Gerges' book, Humanity's Moment. Head to climatecouncil.org.au slash the conversation today to find out more about how you can help drive the urgent change we need. Welcome back to Fear and Wonder. In this first episode, we're learning about how we know the climate is changing. And we've just been hearing from Professor Ed Hawkins about the scientists who spent two decades on top of the tallest mountain in the UK from the 1880s onwards and how they were taking measurements every single hour. The temperature ranged from about plus 15 to minus 15 and the average temperature was freezing day and night throughout the year. That tells you the kind of conditions they were living in. Why did they do this? It's such a feat of endurance and commitment. This was the great era of exploration. Right? This is the same time as that we were setting off for the Antarctic for the first time, for example, the great polar explorers that, that we all know. There was that era where people were doing slightly crazy endurance feats to find out more about how the world worked. I like to think of the Ben Nevis meteorologists as explorers of the atmosphere. In September 2017, Ed started a citizen science project to digitise those handwritten records from Ben Nevis. And in less than three months, he managed to get a few thousand volunteers to key in a million and a half of those records. It's really phenomenal to think about getting volunteers to do this work for you. And it actually inspired me to run a similar citizen science project using this Zooniverse platform to recover early observations for Southern Australia. And it's the part of the country where we've seen the clearest climate change signal. And surprisingly, there are these records that just have not been digitised that the Bureau of Meteorology actually hold, but they're just sitting there sort of decaying in archives and, and we were able to scan them and then get volunteers to to work on them. In November 2017, when Ed was still working on that Ben Never Citizen Science project, some other scientists were hiking up the mountain, lugging gear for a new temporary weather station. And it was still very, very, very windy. We're at the top of Ben Nevis right now, putting up an automatic weather station. That's amazing. This also goes to show that the, the work of monitoring is, is never done, you know, and, and stations will open and close and all sorts of stuff. And that's when they open and close, it's actually really difficult to then join the records up in terms of matching the variability that's contained within them because they might be slightly different site locations or a different elevation or maybe near a tree and all the exposure of the instrumentation can be different. And that's what makes piecing together those historical observations quite challenging. The, probably the biggest technical challenge when you're working with historical observations is to what they call homogenise the records, so try and bring them into alignment in terms of their variability. And you do that statistically, but you have to have periods of overlap where you can see, you know, the ups and downs and the curves and how they match and whether they're offset or not because of those changes in the observatory basically. So even when you've got the numbers, it's not like you can just punch them into your computer and then just start doing data analysis. There's a whole statistical process that goes into it before you can actually use it for climatological reasons. So it's it's really thorough. It takes ages. What's the legacy of it? Like what, what did they learn at the time or what did the science world learn at the time and what do we get out of doing this digitization and reconstruction now? So I think probably at the time they were a bit undervalued and I think we are now learning more about the value of their observations. The very detailed observations we have from there are enabling us to reconstruct particularly extreme events, actually. So we we take the, the data from Ben Nevis and, and other places around the country and use that 
to combine with our modern technology of weather forecasting to produce essentially a weather forecast of the past where we can look at what the weather is doing hour by hour stretching back to the 1800s and so we can build up this picture of what the atmosphere was doing by combining information from various locations to track big storms as they come across the country and learn about these very extreme events which are still today quite unusual compared to what we've seen in the recent period and so we can better understand the risks from extreme weather by mapping those past events in more detail and trying to translate them into the modern context. And so that happened to be up there at the time of a very famous storm. Can you tell me about that? So, so there, were, there were quite a few famous storms that went through, but the, the one we've learned most about is one in 1903 called the Ulysses Storm, which caused enormous damage across the UK. The novel Ulysses by James Joyce, the events in that book were set the year after the storm. And there's a passage in the book which discusses all the trees that were blown down in the storm in Dublin. And so that's why we've named it the Ulysses Storm. And we're now able to reconstruct the passage of that storm in, in very great detail and learn about what caused the damage and understand that, well, if that event happened today, it would probably be stronger, stronger winds than any other event we've seen in the modern era for certain parts of the country. And what was it like on Ben Nevis at that time? Pretty windy. They had winds of over 40 metres per second for a few hours, which was, was probably pretty uncomfortable. There's certainly notes in their logbooks about how there were occasions they were roped together to be able to go outside, to be able to take the measurements. They, they were literally tied together to try and stop themselves from blowing away. 1884, February 16th, owing to storm, every observation was taken by two observers roped together. At 20 hundred hours, as soon as Mr. Ormond went outside the door of the snow porch, he was lifted off his feet and blown back against Mr. Rankin, who was knocked over. And so when he says that if the Ulysses storm happened today, it would probably be stronger, mm. why is that? Well, basically because we're dealing with a warmer planet. So if you stop and think about these events playing out on the background of cooler conditions, there's just not as much energy to to spin up these systems and to, to cause the major destruction. But that's really where I find it fascinating to think, well, if this Ulysses storm that played out in 1903 occurred on the background of a, a planet that's two degrees warmer, three degrees or four degrees warmer, just how much more destructive it would be. And there is there are now studies that are starting to look at things like that. It's the sort of thing we're starting to look at here in Australia, seeing that if we had these heat waves that occurred in the 19th century that were really major at the time, what happens when you actually warm the background conditions by a degree, two degrees or more? And I think for climate change risk assessment, that's really where a lot of people, including places like the insurance industry, want to know, you know, if these events play out, how unusual are they, firstly, in terms of their return periods, so how often they happen, but also their potential to escalate and to be more extreme as the planet continues to warm. So it's it's a really interesting interface of the the connection between weather and climate. So understanding how our daily weather is changing on the background of a warming planet. Right at the start of the show, we heard from Kim Cobb on Christmas Island. And you might guess this track is from Christmas Island. And the artist is Marcin Boy featuring East Life. It's great. Good on you for tracking that down. It's so cool word. So when we left Kim, she just dropped that bomb, which was the 2015-2016 El Nino event and its impact on the reef. We're going to get back to that, but... First, I wanted to find out about how she actually does her research. Ed works on improving our understanding of what we know from the time humans started making those very first weather observations. And Kim's research helps us to look even further back in time to help decipher how the most complex climate cycle on the planet is changing. I, uh, my first trip to Christmas Island was in the spring of 1997. I was a baby graduate student and I was very lucky to be included on a cruise that I probably had no business being on, <laughs> being that clueless. <laughs> um, I was there for a completely different purpose, looking at carbon chemistry in the ocean. But when we were out there in the Central Pacific, we were also in the grip of what was at the time the largest El Nino event on record, 1997-1998, and understanding just how little we we really were able to 
predict that event and its severity and how these events would be changing with climate change was very formative for me. And I, I fell in love with the location as much as I fell in love with the intellectual challenge of chasing this down for the rest of my career. Right. So I've got a kind of background question here for you, Joel. What is El Nino? So it's just basically, you can think of it as the oscillation between cooling and warming of the equatorial Pacific and the shift in the winds associated with those different ocean warming. And what that does is basically take rain bearing systems and shift it in different areas. It's not just about variability in the Pacific region, it's about variability around the world. Yeah, so El Nino actually impacts about 60% of the planet. So although its home is in the equatorial Pacific, it has what's called teleconnections, which are these regional climate variations that occur outside of the Pacific. So here in Australia, it actually impacts much of the eastern part of the country. So Kim's research is really important because what we want to understand is how natural variability is changing as the planet continues to warm. And understanding how it's shifted in the past is really important for understanding how it might change in the future. The corals are growing about, you know, as much as a centimetre, possibly even two per year. In the places like Christmas Island, they're growing extremely fast. So one of the ways that scientists can look at past El Nino variability is by looking at the chemistry that's captured in corals. So we cut them open lengthwise to reveal that record inside. And then we can x-ray these coral cores and that helps us see oftentimes what are annual layers that are laid down by the coral and high density and low density bands, much like you could see a a bone thickness on an x-ray. And we drill every single millimeter down that entire core, tiny aliquots of coral powder that we then analyze for geochemical information. One way Kim does this is by comparing the ratio of two oxygen isotopes that she finds in these coral skeletons. Oxygen 16, which is what you learned about in in school at some point, and oxygen 18, which has two more neutrons, which is also stable and present. Wherever there's oxygen 16, there's oxygen 18. It's just in much smaller quantities. And so the ratio of these two isotopes, more 18O is incorporated into the coral skeleton when it's cooler, and less of it is incorporated into the coral skeleton when it's warmer. It's a very well-established and well-understood proxy for ocean temperatures. It's really fascinating to think about Kim's work in terms of the way we can travel back in time using geochemistry. And she started looking at corals that have died, so they're not living corals anymore. And that allows us to go back centuries, back into the past, and even thousands of years. What can you tell from the corals about El Nino and climate change? Right. So we've been really working on this for over two decades now. And one of the challenges about trying to see a change in El Nino activity in the recent decades versus before is that sometimes it happens every two years, sometimes it happens every seven years, sometimes it's large, sometimes it's small. It's just very hard to see what might be a fairly modest change on top of this very noisy background. And in fact, people publish papers saying, you know, it might take 200 years from now for us to see a change in El Nino activity. Well, of course, the paleoclimate people would say, why don't we look at hundreds of years of information from the past and see if we can build up enough statistics of past El Nino activity so that we might detect a fairly modest change that's already occurring today. And in fact, that's what we've seen. We were able finally to publish a uh, extremely long baseline that together is over 2,000 years worth of El Nino activity from the Central Pacific, from the very heart of the cycle. And so when we took this long baseline and we compared it to what was recorded in the coral skeletons of El Nino activity in the last several decades, we actually saw a statistically significant increase in recent decades compared to this extremely long and detailed baseline. What Kim's talking about in her research is that we're really starting to see that that sort of climate change signal starting to emerge. 
there have been quite a few papers that have come out in, in, in support of this finding, which have worked with data sets from different locations around the Pacific Basin. And there have been some that have suggested that there has been no statistical change in El Nino properties, all coming from different paleoclimate sites and, and different approaches. The jury is somewhat still out in the IPCC. You will see it treated quite gingerly. You need really multiple lines of extremely strong evidence to have something land in the IPCC as, as an impact that's tied to greenhouse gases. But I think it's more likely than not that there has already been a measurable change in El Nino towards stronger extremes in recent decades. Right. So what should we make of this, Joelle? Well, there's a lot in what Kim's just talked about and really it gets to the heart of why climate science is really complicated. So firstly, we have this natural variability and understanding those year-to-year variations are really critically important for understanding how seasons are going to play out as the planet continues to warm. Another really interesting thing that Kim mentioned there was how the IPCC treats uncertainty. Her research team has actually been working on El Nino for over 20 years and everything that they have collated does show a statistically significant shift and intensification of El Nino events. And it's actually something that I found in my own PhD research that I published back in 2005 is this intensification of El Nino events as well. I used a range of different studies, including tree rings from New Zealand, different coral records and ice cores from the Western Pacific. So that's a, that study actually reproduces a result that I found, but just as a, a single study, it isn't enough to say that that's definitive. So with the IPCC, it really works on the weight of scientific evidence. And so we have these confidence statements. And so if you only have a few records that show a particular scientific conclusion, we would say that's low confidence. But that's not to say that Kim's research, which is quite cutting edge, isn't really solid. It is, but we just want to see that reproduced over many, many, many studies. And that's that's actually what makes the IPCC conservative, some people would say. I think intellectually, you know that corals can't withstand a certain temperature threshold for a long time. But somehow, you know, I think we humans are just programmed to think it's more or less going to turn out okay, or it's not going to be the worst case scenario. The real acute losses were documented in, in our April 2016 expedition. So that's when the carnage was visible to me at any rate. Basically 85 to 90% of the reef had succumbed to these bleaching level temperatures and those corals had died in the interim and were you know, covered over in ground red algae and only 5% of the coral cover was still intact. It was the largest ever coral bleaching and mortality event on record in 2016. So there was virtually no reef that was spared that year. As a climate scientist and a, a somebody who knows coral reefs quite well, that was part of processing the loss was the certainty from my perspective as a scientist that the reefs that I dove on in 2014 and 2015 were, would never be back. They were lost forever and there would be no, no recovery. That's a light switch that went off for this reef and it will never be the same. So that's something that is happening to more and more reefs around the world. And unfortunately, a very grim prognosis for up to 90% of the world's coral reefs projected to be lost, even if we keep warming to a bare, bare minimum of 1.5 degrees Celsius globally. But Kim, things were about to get even worse. Our next expedition down there was in November 2016 during the the election for president here in the United States when this country decided to elect an administration which had been very openly hostile to climate science and climate and energy policy that is evidence-based. And so having to go through that while diving on a dead reef that had been killed by climate change was a huge pile on for, for me personally, emotionally. And so it was about three weeks of fairly deep depression, you know, kind of stuck in bed, <laughs> a lot of tears, 
just not being able to put the pieces together to understand what this meant for for our collective future in, in more ways than just climate change, of course, as a mother to four children and, and four daughters at that, deeply disturbing. And so, you know, it really took until my twin's birthday, which is January 1st. And so on January 1st, I woke up and I got out of bed and I said, you know, okay, enough. <laughs> you can't bring your whole family down with you. And so it was a moment to just try something something, anything. And so I, I tweeted out my first climate resolution, which was to bike to work and walk my kids to school at least twice a week. And it was really grasping at straws, but I very quickly realized that this was deeply fulfilling for me. And I got it in my head to try to enact as much as I could what I know to be that 2050 world we will get to. I will live it now to show people that it's not about sacrifice and loss. It's about connection and value and meaning and health, mental health and physical health in ways that it's very hard to see when you're stuck in your car in a traffic jam in Atlanta like I was for 14 years. Obviously, all of us riding our bike isn't going to stop global warming, but all those little small behavioural changes we all make, they do add up. But for Kim, she also decided to take a different direction in her research career. In terms of my professional life, I started to work much, much, much closer to home. So I started working on coastal flooding and sea level rise with communities down in Savannah, Georgia, and then also a project which is focused on urban heat islands in Atlanta. Both of those are projects that allow me to collect information about local climate impacts and think about policy and investments that are required to keep these communities safe. And that's been extremely rewarding and meaningful work. So her final point is that she shifted... To find meaningful work. Shifted her research and her life. Yeah, not that it wasn't meaningful before, but she's changed her idea now, you know, in response to the the evidence about what, what kind of work she needs to do. I think that's something that is a common experience across many scientists working in this space who are starting to see, you know, really confronting things play out in their research. And so they're starting to think about how can I be most useful at this moment in time? And and so some people are looking towards, you know, climate change adaptation, which is how do we get prepared for what's upon us? It's vertiginous. More than a billion observations. We cut them open lengthwise to reveal that record inside. We've covered a lot of time in the episode today, Joelle, from like deep past through to the beginning of the 20th century and then and then beyond. We've heard about how different methods provide us with different lines of evidence that allow scientists to estimate how the climate has changed over these really, really long periods of geologic history. But we've also zoomed in to see how global warming is influencing weather extremes and how that could influence what we experience in the future. We've also heard about how strictly the IPCC vets scientific conclusions and we're beginning to see how all of this information really starts to stack up in terms of providing the foundation for the IPCC's assessment reports. And in the next episode, we're going to shift even further forward in time and find out about some advances in the way that scientists are observing climate change in the past couple of decades. And for that, we're going to get ourselves onto the ice and into the sea. Uh, We stand now below the glacier and uh, at the shore of the lake. So we are getting ready to uh, walk on the ice up to the measurement location where we will do the measurement that is our goal today. Fear and Wonder is produced by me, Michael Green, and co-hosted by Dr. Joel Gerges from the Australian National University. With sound engineering and design and additional story editing and wisdom from John Chia. Script editing by Nicole Kirby. Thanks to the show's executive producer, Ben Clark, and the conversation's editor, Misha Ketchell. Fear and Wonder is sponsored by the Climate Council. And in this episode, special thanks to Dr. Martin Rice, the research director for the Climate Council, for his magnificent Scottish accent. We recorded on Wurundjeri land at the State Library of Victoria. Original music in this show included Entries from the Log by Neil Scriven from his very cool album, 20 Years on Ben Nevis. And also the song Christmas Paradise by Marson Boy featuring East Life, 
You can find more music from Kiribati on the YouTube channel at Kiribati Music. And finally, Joelle wrote about her experience being an IPCC author in her brand new book called Humanity's Moment, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope. Go find it online and in all good bookstores. <laughs>